Hello and welcome to Best in UC TV. I'm your host, Heather Clancy, and today I'm really excited to have two individuals from the Monterey Bay Aquarium with me to discuss some unified communications technologies that the aquarium uses using, both internally and with some of its partners, and I'll let them get into that in a moment. But to, joining us today from Monterey, California, are Ken Peterson, who is the communications director. Hi, Hi Ken. Hi, Heather. Nice to see and, you. And Suri Patel, who is the IS manager, um, handles security and other projects for the aquarium. Hi, Suri. Thank you for joining us to both of you. Hello, Heather. So when, when I found out about your uh, implementation, I was very excited because the aquarium is one of my favorite places in the area. And I was excited to learn that you were looking at technologies to help um, not only improve your own business practices, but, but with a little bit about the environment in mind, because I know the aquarium is very focused on that. I write about sustainability, and that was exciting to me. So I'd like to start um, with either of you discussing just briefly the initial impetus behind the, the sort of technology that you've deployed. And, and actually, please be specific. Uh, we're on a video conferencing system, and that's part of it. Um, but, Suri, can you tell us what the motivation was for making this investment originally? Well, one of the, the principal tenets of the aquarium is to kind of teach about conservation of the oceans, but not just of the oceans. We take it to being good neighbors to our environment, that mm -hmm. kind of families kind of push to kind of follow those tenets. And one of the things we noticed was our people, when they have meetings, they have to travel. So we're talking about carbon footprint in terms of how they travel to a meeting place, meaning the car. Mm -hmm. So if we could reduce that just for local meetings, and in effect, we're actually getting better uses of our resources, our human resources, never mind lowering the carbon footprint. That was one of the impetuses for going to a video conferencing system. We knew that in the beginning, there weren't that many opportunities, opportunities out there for us to kind of video conference with the opposite side. But someone has to take the first step. It is an initial expense that's somewhat large, but without taking that step, you aren't actually helping the situation. So we decided to go ahead with this and just partner up with the people who had them at the beginning. And what we're finding over time, more and more institutions are adopting this technology. Okay, let's be specific about what you have. I think you said you had two rooms at the moment. Um, and can you, can you describe how it's primarily being used right now? Um, primarily, we have um, two systems, as you mentioned, and they are being used to talk to um, groups, not only in a, a meeting sense, but also in a, a research and conserva conservation sense in terms of groups within the United States, continental, sure. and across the country, I mean, across the world, in, in terms of Japan, Hawaii, England, um, we are finding partners more and more willing to work with us, especially if we can reduce the cost of their kind of involvement by doing video conferencing. Ken, as, as the communications director of the aquarium, uh, you have some ideas for how you can extend what you're already doing with the technology. What, can you share with some of those thoughts? Sure, glad to. I, in terms of meetings, I had one in Washington, D.C., a uh, national committee meeting a few weeks ago, and that involved all the travel that Surrey was talking about. I wish I could have done that by video conference, but the folks at the other end don't have the capacity yet. So to be able to do that, to be more engaged uh, mm -hmm. in working with, with our zoo and aquarium partners, for example, would be really fabulous. We had a very specific example recently, an event that we do annually called the Sustainable Foods Institute. The, the aquarium connects the health of the oceans with the health of the way we produce food throughout the system. And we like to bring in national experts, international experts for an audience of journalists and, and food industry professionals to talk about that. Well, one of the folks that we wanted to invite was from a, a British retailer, Marks and Spencer, that has made an unprecedented commitment to reducing its carbon footprint and to greening its operations. And they adamantly refused to get on a plane and fly from London to California to speak for 45 minutes at a conference. Mm -hmm. So we were able in our auditorium for a couple hundred people to set up a video connection and had a fabulous conversation with their chief sustainability officer uh, who was showing products that they're selling that demonstrate their sustainability commitment. And the very fact that she was doing this by video rather than flying sent an incredibly strong message to everyone in that room 
that they were committed and that this is something that you can adopt as a routine practice. Hmm. And I hope we're able to do that with a lot of our other speakers and presenters in the future. Is there also a, you know, a, an academic uh, component to this, right? I imagine you have a lot of researchers, schools and so forth that are looking for access to uh, resources within the aquarium. What, what might you be doing in terms of those sorts of programs? Any ideas there? Actually, at the other video conference room, which is at the Seafood Watch Center, mm -hmm. they are actually carrying out this particular kind of um, video conferencing. Sheila Bowman, who is part of the Seafood Watch group, goes and teaches about their message through video conferencing with universities. I think there was a university in the Midwest that she had. I was involved in setting up the conference with, and so she managed to get her message across to students in the Midwest in sure. one phone call. And that video conference allows you not only to present your point of view as a person, but also to kind of embellish and use other means like posters or a PowerPoint presentation. Mm -hmm. It's a very powerful tool in terms of getting your message across. And it has been used and it is also used for research um, teams uh, Friends at the University of Hawaii meet with our husbandry team regularly in this room. For, from, a, from the standpoint of being a smallish to mid-sized organization, um, you know, what kind of stumbling thing uh, blocks were there uh, when you tried to do this? Actually, it was a very pleasant experience. In terms of cost, <laughs> we limited that cost by going with a startup vendor life size, as opposed to the tandems or the the polygons. We went and use the life size system, which was roughly about half the cost of the other two established vendors. We brought that in and the setup was relatively easy. It took us a day to bring the system up. We did everything in-house. We didn't ask for outside help. And in terms of overall cost, yes, it's a large figure. I mean, our capitals, if anything's over $5,000, it's a capital, and this was a capital project, but the payback period after one year of use, in terms of the number of people that actually use the system, and if we extrapolated out the expenses that would have been generated if they didn't have a video conference system, it paid for itself within the first year. Right. So how hard was it to teach people how to use the system, to get them using the system? Was this a big um, sort of mentality shift for the, for the organization as a, as a cultural thing? Not culturally, it's kind of accepted. I mean, the system itself, although it looks somewhat daunting, it's if you can use a cell phone, you can use a video conference system. It has a menu, it has a directory, you just call. It's just a phone with a video screen. That's about it. And so we had training sessions to tell people that we had the system in-house, and we gave them a, a half an hour training session in small groups and if people have a problem, they still call, but everybody is now somewhat self-sufficient. We have our directory built up of the numbers that we do call. And as we allow outside vendors to call us as well, because we, we give them our IP or our ISDN number, we have kept both on this video conference room. So we help the people who have the older technology connect with us, and most people are now moving to IP. Mm -hmm. And as people already pay for their internet connection through ISPs, there is no additional cost once you go forward. The cost basically is the cost of the system and the maintenance over the, the annual maintenance agreement, which is roughly around 20% to 15% of the cost of the original system. So did you, did you not invest in higher bandwidth then when you put this in, or did you? What, was that a consideration? The, the aquarium actually does have a high bandwidth um, connection to the outside world, so there was no need to, we are running at full HD here. Okay. Two other technical um, questions. One is, um, are, are you able to, you know, I'm calling video conference to video conference. Uh, I'm actually using a similar system to yours. Is it possible to hold, pull in someone who's uh, at a desktop or uh, on, a, on a different sort of device? I mean, how does that work? Can that work? Or is that something you're looking at for the future? Um, currently, these video conference systems really do talk to tr um, true video conferencing systems. In terms of Skype connecting in, no, that's, we are looking to unify all that, but at the current state of um, 
affairs, there is no means sure. to do that, but we do allow people to telephone in so they can have an audio connection into this room. So if we had a third Got party, it. we would let we'd mute the mic and use the telephone and do a conference switch, and they would at least get the audio. Or we can have a WebEx going while we're doing this, and at least they can see the presentation as well as the people on either side. And for Ken, you talked about some of the things you'd like to do. Is that going to require an additional investment in systems at, at this time, or will you have to extend what you have in place? I think if we want to do more uh, presentations in our auditorium, we would want to upgrade that to full video conference capability. We were able to do it this time through a Skype connection, and there was some reluctance on, uh, on the part of our other tech folks. They weren't sure would it look good, would it would it uh, the connection stay up for the for the length of the presentation. It worked out surprisingly well. I think everyone was very pleased with that. Uh, I think our, in that case, Marks and Spencer would have preferred a full video conferencing arrangement. There was some concern about, uh, I think, security on their end over Skype. But in the end, they said, no, this is important to us to get this message out. So, yeah, there would be another investment there to put that in the auditorium. But I think that the payback would be to be able to get in some really world-class speakers, not just for that one event, but we do a lot of auditorium presentations for everything from school groups to members to donors to the general public. And I'll bet that this would be uh, hugely popular and give us some new new capacity to get a conservation message out, inspire people in a lot of different ways. Sure. Well, I want uh, two other questions for you. One is for Surrey. Were there any surprises as you installed this? You said it was pretty easy. Was was there anything that was a, a gotcha, or you you just didn't expect? It wasn't necessarily bad, but just wasn't expected. Um. Actually, the, the, the most unexpected thing was the, how quickly it paid for itself. Mm -hmm. I mean, we didn't keep track of you know, what, how many people used it, but when we did look at the meters, we found out you know, so many hours on the video conference, and then I'd go back and backfill it with information, I mean, verbally, and ask them, where would you have to travel? And even traveling, here's a simple calculation, even if you travel to San Jose, which is roughly an hour and 20 minutes, that's two hours 40 of someone's drive time, Plus, that's unproductive time. And if the meeting is only half an hour, you're still wasting a whole day for half an hour. So we had at least, you know, in the first year, we probably had over 150 video conferences, which is quite a large number. When we're contracting with an architect, if they have to fly three people from the East Coast to California, we're paying for that in the contract with them. We're paying for the lodging that they have and any ground transportation and meals. And if they can do all of that work from their own offices and potentially break away for some other urgent project right there, uh, that's going to get us to that payback very, very quickly. Okay. So final question for you gentlemen. Any tips that you would give me uh, or someone else who is considering to uh uh, purchase. The major reason you do purchase a video conference is if you have a business that requires travel, which is pretty much every business, and the need to have meetings, which is pretty much every business. Every business can probably benefit from video conferencing. You have to justify the expense up front and the usage. The usage, although when asked up front, will people use it? And they kind of say, well, we can do phone calls. But the benefits are soon apparent once you use it once, and then it really does become a game changer. So I would tell people, look at this technology, whether it be through a full video conferencing system or Skype or however your finances lie, doing conferences via Skype or through a video conference system is the greener way to go. It's beneficial not only for the environment, but also for the balance sheets of the organizations that you work for. Anything you'd like to add, Ken? I think Suri said it well. I mean, our mission is to inspire conservation of the oceans. Our mission asks that we walk the talk, that we don't just say we're a conservation organization, but we do everything in our own business practices to set an example for others. And this is a really great example of how we can, we can do what we preach. Excellent. Well, thank you, gentlemen, for joining us today. Really appreciate your time. And thanks to all of you for viewing another episode of Best in UC TV. Until we meet again, I'm Heather Clancy.